Welcome to Name Three Songs. I'm Sarah Fagan. I'm Jenna Million, and this is a podcast where we challenge sexism in the music industry and empower fangirls. Because let's be real, fangirls knew about that band way before you did. And if you stick around long enough, we'll also let you in on some new music the girls are already crazy about. And we have some special shout outs today. Welcome, Emily and Cecily, to our Patreon community. We are so happy to have you all in our growing little community and our Discord of friendship. And for everybody who hasn't been paying attention to what we've been up to on Patreon, our latest Music Meltdown episode was about how Jack Harlow has gone from the internet's favorite white boy to the internet's most hated white boy in the span of like a month and a half, which was actually quite interesting to look into because we couldn't really think of anybody that had as quick of like an uphill to downhill descent other than MGK. So if any of y'all have any thoughts, we'd love to hear about other people we might have missed out on. And we also did discuss some Liam Payne news, <laughs> um, but not the big Liam Payne news. We talked about him cheating on Maya Henry, as well as the whole Halsey TikTok scandal on our Did You Hear episode. So there's lots of good stuff going on on Patreon right now. And you can sign up and get a fun shout out at the start of an episode like all of our other lovely Patreon members by joining up patreon.com slash name three songs so sarah what are we getting into today today is a moment we've all been waiting for full circle if you will we are actually dedicating a whole episode to mr harry styles himself dun 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 <laughs> And I know this might seem like a weird thing for us to say, but we literally started this podcast with One Direction. Like, yeah. that is the foundation of this podcast. And I think a lot of y'all listeners found us because of One Direction as well. As you know, we're big fans of Harry. I think a lot of, I think everyone in general is big fans <laughs> of Harry, but we've kind of just been watching his career progress and we felt like, you know, we've talked about him in various different episodes. We did a whole Larry silence in episode, but it never felt like a right time to do a Harry episode. Yeah. And now because we have HS3, because we have, because we have Harry's house, he's done some more interviews. And so we're really starting to see this arc in his career, like now that he's been mm -hmm. solo for several years. And so we felt like this was kind of an appropriate time to take a look back through everything and revisit some old stuff, talk about new stuff and tie all of the lovely things together in a nice little discussion for you guys. Literally, like it felt truly like Harry's house came at the perfect time for at least myself as a human, but also just like four name three songs as a podcast. Because like Jenna said, it's weird to say that a podcast in 2020 that clearly is no longer about One Direction started because of One Direction. But I think a lot of us regressed into our One Direction fangirlness at the start of COVID lockdown just to like have some sort of joy from something that once used to just feel and still does feel pretty just like joyous and something to go back to in that way. And Harry, I think, or we all pretty much know like how much he's grown and changed and really come into himself as a person. And I think with the interviews that were coming out from this HS3 season, if you will, other than him going back to Howard Stern, which like somebody needs to have a word with him about <laughs> continuously giving that man his time, you can see how Harry's making decisions that sort of fit more with who he is as a person and while he still very much is within that world of having a personal life and a professional persona who he is is shining through more and he's feeling more comfortable in himself which is just a really warming thing to see because he came into the spotlight at such a young age harry was like 15 or 16 when he was on x factor and so he truly grew up in the spotlight and he hasn't had many years in his life where he hasn't been just like the daily mail's favorite man to put photos up of on the front page of the website you know and so with harry growing up in the spotlight being being these, this boy, really, who the Daily Mail were obsessed with, who were writing about him constantly, and kind of deciding who the world was going to see him as, I think is a really interesting thing and a really interesting narrative for us to look into, especially now with all of our gained knowledge from doing this podcast, all of our gained knowledge from Harry having more interviews as a solo artist over the past two years, but also just acknowledging that like while he was in One Direction and while all of the boys were in One Direction, they had to be open books because that's what being in a boy band is. Like yeah. you sign up to not to give your whole entire self 
to your sea of girlfriends because that's what the fans are kind of viewed as. Like you're selling this kind of idea of like you could be their boyfriend. Like that's what they're yeah. selling as by being in a boy band. And like people will talk a lot about how like when Harry kind of transitioned from Harry of One Direction to Harry Styles, the rock star, pop star we know of him as today, how his Instagram was like completely deleted. He became like this new person. And it's just like when you're forced to give everything to the world and the world still decides that you're somebody that you are adamantly denying that you are it can feel really scary to go into like a new phase of your life with the world still having access to all that you gave them during that time because obviously they had like their diary sessions and they had all these behind the scenes videos and all this stuff where you really got to see how fun and energetic and like life loving Harry was and then he kind of like retreated before going into his solo career but also in releasing Sign of the Times as his first ever solo song he's proving to the world that he wants to be taken seriously as an artist that he wants to be viewed as an artist not an ex-boy band member and so there was a lot of work and intricacy that went into this especially when like I keep saying the media decided and like the boy band gods decided what his role was and what his label was. And it was this idea of being a womanizer. And I think that that's something that fans still talk about to this day. I think a lot of people don't really realize how much it affected him. Like I kind of even forgot, but looking back at old articles of just him vehemently denying, like just because I hang out with women doesn't make me a womanizer and them still plastering Womanizer on headlines for years. And even Howard Stern, like the first yeah. time he interviewed Harry Styles was like, so a womanizer like they really really leaned into that and it's interesting seeing the theme of metamorphosis continuously pop up in the interviews he's been doing surrounding harry's house because it feels as though fans knew that he had this in him like who he is today but he didn't necessarily know that he had it in him because he was like surrounded by a narrative about himself that he did not create yeah i think also any time we see someone who becomes famous at a young age, you're still figuring out who you are in the world as a person. And like, as a teenager, you don't even realize that. Like for me, even like in my early 20s, I was going through like these radical periods of just like transformation in my life and like figuring out who I am and like how I navigate the world and how like I want to be seen in the world and just like how I identify like all of those things when you start something when you're 16 like being in a boy band you don't realize all that life progression still has to happen mm -hmm. and so and I think by time you know One Direction went on hiatus like it was kind of that period in Harry's life where he was like in his early 20s and needed to figure out who he was in cl behind closed doors you know in that private life and even in this this Zane Lowe like Harry's house interview he talks about like COVID being that period for him where he's like I have to figure out who I am outside of the label musician that's such a big thing and I think that's something that we don't talk a lot about and we don't really give space for artists or you know famous people to have that period of their life of like figuring out who they are because like their whole life they've been told they've been told who they are they've been told what role they fill like even thinking about Britney Spears yes They've always been told what they're supposed to be. And thankfully, Harry is humble enough or like was raised well, like combination of things. Thankfully, Harry is like grounded enough that mm -hmm. he knew he didn't want to be that because he so easily could have turned into like Justin Timberlake 2.0, not even Justin Timberlake 2.0. Like I literally want to say like Mick Jagger. 2.0 yeah. because like going through these interviews and every time he's referred to as a womanizer I think so much of it has to do with his charm and his charisma his personality but also his looks and the fact that his looks call back to Mick Jagger so much yeah. that I think a lot of people are just like sex symbol yes the 21st century sex symbol like Harry Styles rock star god can sleep with any woman he wants to and he's like that's not me that's not what I want to be that's not what I represent and yeah. so it's really interesting that like he has been able to navigate this with everyone just like telling him exactly what they think of him the whole time yeah it's just like horrifying that at such a young age people were trying to push this narrative onto him when it's like everybody's gone to school with a boy who is 
reminiscent of what Harry Styles was like when he was in One Direction and being kind of like charming and whatever he was like there are boys like that that you grow up with and they're not really always going to be like that most popular boy in school or like having all these girls being obsessed with them or whatever the case is because they're kind of weird and they're kind of out there and they're just kind of like silly but because he was in a boy band and because he was famous they're like oh yes like this is who he has to be and you know we can't talk about this without bringing up the dreaded GQ interview <laughs> can I just say this GQ interview that we're about to get into this is literally the interview that started this podcast <laughs> um and like I have to get props to Sarah for like educating me personally so much because she was like look at the way they're like writing about them and I was like yeah but I, <laughs> I didn't really I didn't grow up reading like pop culture or reading interviews, so I didn't really know what was going on. And so now to look at this interview, like with all everything we've learned on this podcast two years later, this interview is literally atrocious, like hot garbage fire. Like I cannot believe. So anyways, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah, for this education. Oh, anytime. <laughs> It's, it's, maybe you guys a, feel the same way it's been an honor and a privilege <laughs> and i really just appreciate that you've let me take you on this journey and it's been fun watching you learn because it's yeah. it's just incredible like going back and grabbing this interview from the our like first ever outline for this podcast which was a mess and then <laughs> but grabbing it now and just like seeing the difference of like how you respond to articles and like the way people write is so yeah. interesting yeah. and so that and that was what was so interesting also even for me like rereading this article which i reread have multiple times in my life but the article which did not have this title originally but has changed it i don't know what it was originally called but goes this one direction interview got us death threats in gq of 2013 written by jonathan heath and it's just a clusterfuck and so basically this time since we're not talking about one direction i mainly just pulled the stuff from the Harry section of this interview because the whole thing was a fucking mess and he talked really negatively about One Direction's fans and just like teen girls being excited about music in general. Lots of nonsense that really harkens back to like why a formative reason behind this podcast is celebrating what fangirls love and kind of teaching about how fangirl behavior can be normal and how to deal with all these things and normalize it. And a lot of it stemmed from this fucking interview. But basically, the things of interest that I at least thought at this interview is that Jonathan Heath is talking about how he's not allowed to interview any of the six members on their own and that he's given a short list of things that he's restricted from talking about, which include talking about Taylor Swift for Harry and that he's not allowed to discuss with Zane cheating allegations. But anyway, he starts his Harry Styles section of this interview by saying, Harry Styles wears presently One Direction's only pair of visible cojones. The rest of them might as well be eunuchs, which Jenna lovingly found the definition for us, which means a man who has been castrated, especially in the past one who was employed to guard the women's living areas at an oriental court. So that's really nice of him to say. And so Mr. Heath goes on to say, he is the band's libido, their inner mojo made physical and with great hair. If Julian Bonanta feels that what this band needs more of is a human face, real and tangible, perhaps more importantly, readable, then Harry Styles is the only one who currently delivers outside of the world of tween girls. Fact. He's the youngest member of the group, just as Robbie Williams was in Take That. And just like Williams, he seems to be the most willing to just go out and enjoy himself. Minder or no minder, pop band or no pop band, he's their rock star. The cool kid. The one who goes out, out all night with Urban and then he uses a word that no teenager will know the meaning of so it doesn't even matter. He's basically talking about he goes out with people who enjoy art and uh, take place in an artistic bubble such as Kate Moss, Jamie Hintz, Rita Ora, Cara Delevingne, and Nick Grimshaw, the Radio 1 breakfast host who has scarified 1 million listeners in order to make the station cool again. According to one source very close to Grimshaw, speaking to the ingratiating of styles into such a u usually impenetrable London click is in fact solely through the 28 year old radio host. Grimshaw is Styles enabler so far as cool London is concerned and for the period they seemed inseparable swapping clothes or staying out all night together. At times rumors circulated that the pair were indeed more than just close friends. It's all credit to Styles, really that such a relationship seemed perfectly credible. And then number one he's insinuating that 
something about Harry's sexuality, which like, again, this is 2013. So this is an 18 year old that he's talking about who's like, it's none of, it's nobody's fucking business. What's going on as my favorite thing to say about Harry Styles is it's none of our fucking business. But he goes on to then lean into this womanizer idea, which is, it's also well known, however, that Styles is fond of a female companion. He's like Russell Brand, just minus the needy braggadocio. And so then he goes on to talk about some of Harry's potential conquests, including one of Rod Stewart's daughters and Caroline Flack and Taylor Swift and Kagi Dunlop from Made in Chelsea, which he just refers to as one of the blondes, but Kagi deserves a name, I think. And he just like goes to paint this picture of Harry as this womanizer and as this person who like can't be trusted around your daughter, which is just unnecessary. And I don't really think that there was that much to back this up with personally well (laughs) no there was nothing to back it up with that's why he's doing this stupid interview where he goes on to like ask him exactly how many people he slept with but i mean just from the start he's singling out harry among the rest of the members he's saying the rest of the members like don't mean shit could never pull a girl in their lives like that's what he's insinuating first of all rude and disrespectful second of all i'm just like why harry but i think it has so much to do with his charm and his persona and like i said his looks that invoke images of mick jagger like i think that's what it all is and earlier when we were talking about this sarah was pointing out the fact that louis and liam and zane were all in pretty serious relationships throughout the duration of being in one direction Mm -hmm. And so Harry just became the natural charismatic bachelor type because sorry sorry Niall I guess Niall's a little too goofy on the spectrum to be that rock star level as Harry is. But the thing is is that Jonathan Heath goes on to explain that he believes that the group interview scenario is for Styles's benefit rather than anybody else's basically insinuating like Oh, if I get Harry alone, he's gonna he's gonna tell me all the bad stuff he's been doing and all the girls he's been hooking up with and all of this stuff. And then God gives him the gift, is basically what he says, of Louis and Zane, who Harry was supposed to be interviewed as a group with, being stuck in traffic and Harry getting alone time with Mr. Jonathan Heath himself, who starts the questioning by asking him about rumors about him and Harry and Nick Grimshaw, in which Harry is like, I don't know what rumors you're talking about. And then Jonathan, instead of dropping it, is like, oh, that you guys are like an item. And then goes on to be like, oh, are you bisexual? And Harry's like, bisexual? Me? I don't think so. I'm pretty sure I'm not. Which, again, he's 18. Who knows? But also, like, of course he's going to say that. And then he asks, do these rumors feel at all intrusive? And Harry goes, some of them are funny. Some of them are ridiculous. Some of them are annoying. I don't want to be one of those people that complains about the rumors. I never like it when a celebrity goes on Twitter and says, this isn't true. It is what it is. I tend not to do that. The only time it gets really annoying is that if you get into a relationship and you get into a place where you really like someone and then things are being written in the papers that affect them and how they see you, then it can get annoying. The only, I think, interesting question of all of this or interesting answer that we get in this whole interview is when Jonathan asks, are you getting more used to being this famous? And Harry says, I don't think you can ever get used to being this famous. I've learned how to keep things separate or at a distance which is going to come into play later on in this episode. I have nothing to hide, but seeing this as work, like a job, means I can take a step back. It's me right now in front of you and in the papers, but it's not all of me. If you give yourself entirely to the business, you'd end up going mad, and I'm not mad. Not yet. And he still isn't. He knew this this when he was 18! I know. Oh my god. I feel like these are inclinations that Harry has what it takes to break that boy band mold, to not just be like another Justin Timberlake, not just to have this like flash in the pan kind of moment of like putting on an R&B album and then people kind of just knowing who you are for the rest of your life, but instead being a real mainstay in like music history, like he's clearly proving that he has the skill set to do and has like the good head on his shoulders to have the ability to do that, to kind of understand that you can't give all of yourself to the public because if you do you're never going to be able to like create the music you want to and you're always going to just be like a public idea of you rather than anything else I didn't even notice this quote when I read this. And then like now that you're saying it, like after reading all the other interviews we've read with him, I'm like, whoa, like I'm like he he knew this then he knew this when he was in the bands that like he 
didn't want to give all of himself away. And I think he said in another interview how, like, it felt like when he was in the band, he had to give all of himself away. And the only thing that was his was, like, his sex life or his sexuality. Those were, like, that was, like, the only private thing in his life. And here he is getting pressed for it because Jonathan Heath goes on to ask, do you know how many people you've slept with? I just need to interrupt you very quickly because I cannot believe that he went from getting such an insightful and interesting response to the question of, are you getting more used to being this famous? And rather than be, like, a good journalist and go off off of like this really insightful nugget that Harry gave him. He's like, oh yes, I need to ask him how many people he slept with. Like, I just can't, I all, can't All of them were lead up questions. It was all lead up questions to this. Like, I, it's just shocking to me. Like I get, like I can see how they were, but I just like can't believe that as a journalist, you would lose out on the opportunity to like follow up on what Harry just said and instead just be like, no, gotta, gotta ask how much of a slut he is, gotta do it. It's because this man came into this interview wanting to make Harry out to be a womanizer. That was literally his goal and mission with this entire interview. And it's so apparent in the way he wrote it, like not even trying to hide anything. So he asked like what, what the number is, the number of people that Harry slept with. And Harry's like, I'm definitely not telling you with an exclamation point. And then he's like, you know, give me like, give me a ballpark. And then he's like, say yes or no, less than 100. And then Harry says no. So he's like, oh, so higher than 100. And Harry's like, no, definitely less than 100. He goes lower than 50, lower than 30. And then he's like, come on, you're rock star. You know, just tell me. And finally, Harry goes, yeah, two people. I've only had sex with two people. And then he goes, I don't believe you. And the Harry goes, well, that's my answer. Read it for what you will. At which point, Zayn and Louis walk in. And I'm like, how, how is there not management or PR? Like somebody in the room as this was happening? Because mm-hmm. he's literally cornering Harry. He's literally putting him in a corner to the point where he finally like gives him the answer he wants because he doesn't know what else to do. And in this Better Homes and Garden interview from 2022, the one that just came out, he talks about how he felt like he had to be coy with his answers because he was always afraid he was going to say the wrong thing or he was always afraid he was going to like upset people. And he seems very much the type who like doesn't want to make other people feel uncomfortable. I think that's yeah. like a really big thing for him. But he's being the one made uncomfortable. And instead of calling it out and being like, can we not talk about this or something, you know, he doesn't want to be that like celebrity that's like not playing along or like, you know, not being agreeable or anything i'm just like this is so sad that he literally just like got pinned into a corner like this yeah but it's the same thing with like both of the howard stern interviews he's done yeah is that like in both instances you kind of see him having to like skirt around these like really horrific questions that he's being asked or things that like he wouldn't necessarily want to share and it's like I can understand in some regard like Howard Stern asking about like oh is this really horny song about your new girlfriend Olivia Wilde and like Harry not wanting to share about his relationship because Harry's never been one to share about his relationships but to like kind of go around it and be like oh well we we have a really good trust and talk about how that trust helped in her directing him and don't worry darling but obviously you know people are gonna take that a different way because they always do but it's that thing that harry does which he's done literally with any question howard stern's ever asked and this is the thing and, and at least for me frustrates me as a harry fan when it's like you know, and he like talks about being a feminist and caring about women's rights and all these things and having Howard Stern be like, oh, are you afraid to look weak in front of your female therapist? Is she not going to want to fuck you? And Harry to be like, well, how dare you even say that? Like, it's the only time he really like stood up for himself at any point during any of these like really ridiculous questioning of him being like, what what makes you even think that she'd want to sleep with me? Like, how, like, but most of the answers to, like, these ridiculous questions that Howard Stern asks him in these interviews, he's very coy with it. He's very much just, like, skirting the question, answering it in whatever way he can to kind of, like, have it be finished. But, like, it's Howard Stern, so he's not going to stop. But it's one of those things where, like, you can tell when you read an interview if Harry feels some sort of trust or, like, camaraderie with the interviewer that he's speaking with because he still has that mindset of, like, needing to be coy and needing to, like, not share things because like he doesn't want to give too much information about like those that he's sharing his life with because they're not hit only his stories to tell and he likes to keep his cards close to his chest which like I don't really blame him after spending five years in a boy band having other people decide what his narrative is even when he's basically saying like yeah I only sleep with people when like I have romantic feelings for them 
Yeah. I mean, the thing with Howard Stern is it's like, as you said, he kept like skirting around the question and like, but oh my God, Howard Stern was just saying the most sexist, like vile bullshit of like, oh, well, like you have a woman therapist. So like you must be seducing her. And he was like, how do you know she's not going to seduce me? You know? So he's Mm -hmm. like definitely like pushing back at like the double standards and whatnot, but still not like directly calling it out, which is just how Harry is. So, I mean, it's, like, it would be awesome if he just, like, totally called Howard Stern out and be, like, actually, that's really sexist and I don't like when you say those things. But he he will never do that because he doesn't want to upset people because as much as he doesn't like it, he still is kind of that people pleaser. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely. But that's what I'm, like, was kind of meaning before. It's, like, you want to see him as, like, this feminist, as, like, this person who does as much right as he can, really just, like, stand up for women in front of Howard Stern and be like, take my mic pack off, I'm leaving. But he's never going to because he's, like very well media trained and he's very like polite and like his parents raised him well and like he was just kind of taught to just yeah be a people pleaser really but I think that that's why we ran into this issue of just kind of him never a hundred percent even standing up for himself in regards to this womanizer response or like people calling him a sex symbol because he had an interview in 2013 with Look Magazine where he said I don't think I can ever get used to any amount of attention I get in no way am I a sex symbol definitely not and then there was this Cosmopolitan article that cites an interview which they did not link back to or tell us what the interview was so I'm just going to have to cite Cosmo which was written in 2012 called One Direction's Harry Styles quote I'm not a womanizer and so it says in a recent interview the curly haired cutie admitted that yes he did have some fun with the ladies but nowhere near as much fun as everyone may think Harry said I'm an 18 year old boy and I'm having fun I'm just not having as much fun as people make out I don't want to be viewed as a womanizer or whatever. I like having fun, but it's nice to wake up in your own bed, isn't it? And so the author of this article goes on to write, Could Harry's sudden desire to remove himself from his womanizer image have anything to do with recent rumors in the tabloids, which suggest that the One Direction boys have been banned from doing anything which might harm their image? And then there's a quote here that has no attribution that said, Everything One Direction do is scrutinized and judged by the media, and the public and the boys are finding it hard to cope. They've been placed under strict instruction by management not to do anything to harm their squeaky clean image so that quote feels like it came from like a source tells us yeah 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 (laughs) well i was gonna say uh, harry's talked about how you know they had a clause in their one direction contract that was basically like they can't do anything out of line and if they do they could get kicked out of the band i think also growing up he was kind of that as we said like a people pleaser like wanting to follow the rules and i think probably because he talked about how when he got his contract as a solo artist that when he found out that clause wasn't in it he was like crying from relief of being scared that he would like fuck up and I think that was like a lot of pressure on him yeah so like that was in that better homes and gardens interview and what Lou Stopard wrote in that article was that Styles said he often spent interviews terrified about saying the wrong thing until he stopped to question what abhorrent belief or bizarre opinion he was scared he'd accidentally reveal and realized he couldn't think of anything. He thought about how when good things happen, say a number one album, he wouldn't feel happy, just relieved. And he thought about the cleanliness clauses in the contracts he used to sign, which would dictate that they would be null and void if he did anything supposedly unsavory, and about how terrified that used to make him, and about how when he signed his solo contract and learned that the ability to make music would not be affected by personal transgressions he burst into tears a reaction he still seems shocked by retelling it to me now years later i felt free he explained and harry also talked about this when he was interviewed by rob sheffield in 2019 for rolling stone which was that really cute cover story that he did and harry said to rob while i was in the band i was constantly scared i might sing a wrong note I felt so much weight in terms of not getting things wrong. I remember when I signed my record deal and I asked my manager, what happens if I get arrested? Does it mean the contract is null and void? Now I feel like fans have given me an environment to be myself and grow up and create this safe space to learn and make mistakes. And so with this context, which I think is, again, why we felt like now was the right time to do a Harry episode, is because we have context. We have information. We have it straight from Harry. Like, Harry is no longer afraid to, like, speak his truth and tell people, like, how it is really. And that, like, there isn't this fear of standing up for himself 
or fixing the narrative, so to speak. Because I think at the time when he was being called a womanizer, he was saying as much as he felt like he could without causing issue to like the persona or label that he'd been dubbed as like that member of the boy band or whatever the case may be. Yeah, 100%. And I think also I was just thinking about it. Like imagine growing up in the limelight and like that's what you're being told. I like literally cannot believe like Harry you know, clearly had whatever combination of upbringing or just like his personality, like I said, being very grounded, it would have been so easy for him to go off the deep end and like turn into just like an awful human being because this is like literally what you're being told that you are. And I was thinking also growing up and like, I don't know if any of you guys have had this experience, but especially being in the South, you know, when you're growing up, especially as a girl, like a young girl, like you'll overhear parents saying comments to each other like oh my gosh like you know you're referring to you as a young girl like your daughter's so pretty like you you need to be careful like you better have a shotgun in -hmm. reference to boys are going to come chasing after her and you need to have a shotgun to shoot the boys out of your front yard and like I heard this comment very recently very recently in regards to somebody else obviously but I was just like wow like people still say that stuff and I remember overhearing that type of stuff said about me and I had no idea what it meant because I was much younger at the time so I had no idea the implications of that but becoming like a teenager where you like have more understanding of the world and being told that like yeah I'm I'm just yeah no exactly Exactly. But I mean, also, I guess in the media's eyes, it didn't help that Harry was hanging out primarily with like older people in this True. like London cool people scene or whatever. But the thing is, like when you think about it, it's like the choices of who Harry chose to hang around with while they were older, they weren't necessarily like these really bad influences. Like, of course, they were partying and drinking and stuff. But I mean, Harry even now talks about how like when he's on tour, like when the show is over, he's not going out and partying and drinking and doing this stuff. Like he's going to bed, he's getting 10 hours of sleep, he's resting because he wants to put on the best show possible and like while he sings about cocaine and drinking and partying and stuff it's like clearly when he's talked about like his drug use and all these things like he's taking part in these things in like safe environments and I feel like Harry has always had this idea around him that if he feels safe and he feels comfortable like he'll let his hair down and he'll do what he wants to do but if he's not in his comfort zone he's not necessarily going to do that which I think is like very admirable and something like my parents kind of raised me to do where they're like if you feel safe and you feel like you've gotten things from like a safe source or whatever the case is like do it in our house do it with us do it with people you feel safe with like just don't do things because you feel pressured to do them do them when you feel comfortable like if you feel comfortable doing them and I feel like that's a lot of like what Harry's life was like because it's like you can say what you want about Caroline Flack or the other older women or or Nick Grimshaw or older men that he was hanging out with but like they were never bad people they were never doing anything like that insane when like Harry was hanging around with them and there was never like any full-on proof that like Harry was doing anything sexual with these older women but I mean it's been proven that Harry does like an older woman or two there was a Daily Mail article in 2012 by Laura Gould called One Direction Harry Styles I won't see anybody older than my mom She's 43, by the way, in 2012. And so they're talking about how he dated Caroline Flack, who was 33 at the time, that he apparently had a well-publicized fling with a 32-year-old married DJ named Lucy Horobin. I have no idea what that's about. And that also he was seen out with Natalie Imbruglia, who was 37 at the time. And so it says, Harry goes on to downplay his Lothario image, insisting that many of the women he's linked with are merely friends saying, quote, I guess I go out in London and quite a lot of the girls I get photographed with are just friends. And then according to the papers, I have like 7,000 girlfriends, (laughs) which I think is quite funny. And I think also when you are in this boy band, when you are who he was and who he still is, it's like any girl you get photographed with is going to be a potential fling that the newspaper is going to write about. And 
speculate about because like Jenna said, most of the time throughout One Direction's time frame, every other member other than Niall, which for some reason Niall was like a misnomer, like nobody ever acknowledged him for some reason. But like Louis and Zayn and Liam had serious relationships because Liam had Danielle and then Sophia and Louis was with Eleanor almost the whole time and Zayn had Perry. And so you see them in their like serious relationships that they're talking about these girls in interviews and that sort of thing. And Harry's never like really name dropping the women or girls that he's hanging out with like he's only ever paparazzi with them that sort of thing because again like we keep saying like harry wanted to be coy about this stuff he wanted to like not say things in order to like not share something that the women that he was spending his time with wouldn't want him to share because he felt like that was personal and it's nobody's business except for theirs and so we know that like if harry had permission or whatever the case is to speak about somebody he would but if he doesn't feel like it's necessary to share with the world then why force him to share it yeah i also think like the him going out and you know running in these types of circles especially in London especially with his age and whatnot it like adds to the optics that like he is hooking up with all these people which is basically what he said and we know the tabloids love to run with a good photo a good paparazzi photo and just share whatever headline they feel like sharing for that day so I think it, it was a combination of things because it's like historically what we've seen in pop culture history from people who go out a lot, who get photographed a lot, is that, like, that's the path that they all follow, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But the thing is, and that the, the thing that keeps triggering in my brain as we're talking about this and as we were looking at articles for this is that even though Harry has seemingly, as a solo artist, became a bit of an LGBTQ plus icon, and even though he still does not really talk about his girlfriends in interviews or anything like that, never once has he been photographed with a man and anybody made the same sort of comments that they make about him when he's photographed with women, which I do find interesting because I would think that if somebody is so clearly utilizing queer imagery or whatever, that like it would be fair game. To, like, yeah. do that same thing. I mean, well, we saw this with Nick Grimshaw, right? Because yeah. it was in the GQ interview. That was, like, the one very clear instance of, like, insinuating that he might be in a relationship with a man. And Jonathan Heath's comment was, like, because of Harry, people would assume that. Not because of Nick Grimshaw, for whatever reason. Yeah, yeah. So it is interesting that, like, that came up and like seemingly never really came up again because I do remember people being like oh is there something going on with like Nick Grimshaw and Harry I feel like it's just a very stereotypical like very sexist narrative of like the tabloids don't even really pay attention to it because the bisexual thing is so outside the realms of like I don't know it's literally it's kind of sexist or like bi erasure even you know what I mean yeah of just being like no he's a womanizer like he dates women and then like that like that's the end of the story (laughs) but I guess all Also, if you really, like, think about it, like, he's very rarely seen with other men. So, I mean, he could either be really good at hiding it or just not bisexual. (laughs) Yeah. But, again, that's none of our fucking business. It was just something to acknowledge when, like, you constantly see the media and, like, the paparazzi paparazziing him. And, like, don't get me wrong. I feel like somebody's going to come at me and be like, that grid only comes out when you call them. And it's like, that's not 100% true. I work as a photo editor. I know how this stuff works. So don't like come at me with your facts that you've gotten from some random woman on TikTok who's never worked in the (laughs) entertainment media industry in their life. Like, yes, there are certain paparazzi agencies that have ins with managers where they'll be told where celebrities are staying or like, oh, they're going to eat at this restaurant. Oh, they're going to go do this thing. But paparazzi still have their inside information outside of that where like they're told like oh this person's on this flight plan oh this person's checked into this hotel we didn't know that they were staying here like paparazzi are still trying to get that shot outside of their relationships with people's teams because there has to be some sort of a symbiotic relationship going on there in order for celebrities to get written about and for paparazzi to make money and like they do in some ways work together I'm not saying Harry Styles is out there on the phone being like oh me and Olivia are going on vacation in Italy but I am saying that somebody on Harry Styles team or whatever is like oh he has an album coming out like we need articles written about him because that's how fame works like any celebrity like you see more paparazzi photos around them when they have a movie coming out or an album dropping or whatever the case is 
So, I mean, like, something would be bound to slip, is all I'm saying. Like, it would be completely impossible to hide everything from your life, from the world, just because of, like, how many people have cell phones and paparazzi wanting money and all that fun stuff. But that's besides the point. That's a whole other tangent that I've just gone on, but I needed to go on it because I brought it up. But... With all of this womanizer stuff being said, and also this theme that I mentioned at the beginning that Harry is acknowledging like this metamorphosis that he's gone through, specifically that he was allowed to go through because of kind of the freedom that he was given because of the pandemic and like how he'd been going nonstop for 10 or 11 years. Like he never got a break every single second of his time in One Direction was focusing on touring, focusing on making a new album. Like he was a workhorse. They all were when they were in One Direction. And then when One Direction goes on hiatus, it's like Harry wanted to create his own music and he talks about this. But I feel like for some people in their mindset, it's like he had work he had to do. There wasn't a break, even though One Direction went on hiatus. There was like a little bit of downtime and then like, okay, I need to think about how I want to reintroduce myself to the world as a solo artist and become this yeah. new person. And he never got to really figure out who he was as a person, yeah. which is why we've kind of seen him. I feel like stumbles the wrong word, but I feel like it's the only word that I can think of right now is like stumble into like this new version of himself of like slowly kind of like a baby fawn figuring out who he is in public because he was never given this time to really figure out who Harry Styles was outside of One Direction, outside of like this person who's been famous throughout most of his life that he's going to remember, you know? Yeah. And he finally was given this time where like he was spending all of his time throughout the pandemic between LA and England with like a very specific bubble of friends, basically figuring out what am I going to do with this time? Oh, I'm, I want to write this new album. I want it to feel this, have a certain feeling, have a certain idea. And like, he really truly was able to like figure out who he was as a person these past two years. And like that all culminated in Harry's house. You made really good points of it's like, he's been slowly getting there. It's like baby steps. Yeah. Him slowly getting there. And like now in Harry's house, it feels very like he's comfortable with who he is. He knows who he is. He knows what he wants to be doing with his career. But even in 2017, when he did his solo album, we see him hinting at this pattern really. Because in the 2017 Rolling Stone interview, which was his first solo interview, the writer Cameron Crowe points out that the fame visited upon Harry Styles in his years with One Direction was a special kind of mania. With a self-effacing smile, a hint of darkness, and the hair invariably described as tousled, he became a canvas onto which millions of fans pitched their hopes and dreams. And I think that's what he was. I think that's what he still is. I think yeah. anytime we have a celebrity figure, he's like basically describing a parasocial relationship. Uh, but like in the One Direction sense of it, he was like, you know, a heartthrob. And so lots of girls and fans in general were, you know, have this idea of what Harry is. And to your point, he needs to figure out who Harry is himself. And Harry goes on to say about his music, I didn't want to write stories. I wanted to write my stories, things that happened to me. The number one thing I wanted to be was honest. And I hadn't done that before. And like you said, it's these baby steps of figuring out like in one direction, you know, while they may have contributed to the writing, they were never really fully their own stories to tell. There was always kind of that boy band narrative of like, you know, there's a certain type of songs that boy bands write. Yeah. And so Harry's will like, you know, what do I want to be? What do I want to be without this image of the boy band? And I think he took it very seriously in trying to figure that out. And that's why he didn't rush his first album. And so Harry goes on to say about his album, I want to step it up. There were some songs I wanted to write and record and not just have it be, here's a demo I wrote. Every decision I've made since I was 16 was made in a democracy. I felt like it was time to make a decision about the future and maybe I shouldn't rely on others. And so then his producer is saying that working with Harry made him realize that Harry in One Direction was kind of a, a digitized version of Harry, almost like a character. And he says, I don't think a lot of people know sides of him that are on this album. You put it on and people are like, this is Harry Styles. And <laughs> that's funny because that's the entire reaction we've been getting this entire pandemic in relation to Harry Styles. And I think, you know, TikTok spreading that and making people realize this is Harry Styles, literally. But I mean, like even the producer he's working with is like One Direction, you know, it was an image like, and yeah. it was an image that was given to him. It wasn't 100% Harry. Like, yes, we did see sides of Harry, but it wasn't 100% him. And I mean, to your point of like, he's figuring out who he is, you know, there's sides of him we still don't know. Yeah. 
But I think also it just goes to show that like his fans have never once faltered in their belief in him and like his yeah. ability. And like, I feel like never once have I personally been shocked by the music he's put out or who he clearly is getting his inspiration from and all that sort of stuff. So it's like not to blow smoke up our asses as fans of Harry Styles, but I just I feel like part we we kind of believed in him before he believed in himself and we saw it in him and like have seen it in him. And like, that's been so clear by like the one direction fans who followed him and supported him into his solo career, as well as like the more, cause like there are completely insane Harry Styles fans as there are of every type of fan. But I feel like the more down to earth fans. So most of y'all listening to our podcast, like we're on the same playing field of like knowing that Harry had this in him and that like none of this is a shock and that when Harry says like, oh, this next album's going to be more me to like not expect HS1 again and like those sort of things and knowing that his first solo album, while like it was a bit of him, it was still that thing of having that fear of like completely distancing himself from One Direction still and seeing that happening and it's just funny to hear points of views from other people who like weren't fans of his when he was in one direction be like oh i wasn't expecting this from harry styles and it's like but we all were this was what we all knew he could do and had the ability to do just based off of like the music he would say he was passionate about or whatever the case is and so i just think it's funny because also in this interview harry says i like to separate my personal life and work it helps i think for me to com compartmentalize it's not about trying to make my career longer. Like, I'm not trying to be this mysterious character because I'm not. When I go home, I feel like the same person I was at school. You can't accept to keep that if you show everything. There's the work and the personal stuff, and going between the two is my favorite shit. It's amazing to me. And <laughs> I love that. I love it so much because it just shows that Harry has refused to lose himself to the fame. And I feel like yep. that's even proven more in like the more recent interviews he's done is that he has like a tight knit group of friends that he's made. Like he has these people that are his safety net that know him and know who he is and like he shares himself with. And I feel like it was would have been so easy for him to just become a Justin Timberlake to put out yep. an album, been on our list in that episode of to like do boys, a Liam Payne. yeah, <laughs> boys to men sort of situation of like being overtly sexy on their first album just to prove a yeah. point. And he yeah. didn't do that. He was like, no, I believe my skill set is strong enough to like put out music and people to believe in me. And they did. And it's because even though he's always been like coy and like kind of keeping his cards to his chest and like all that sort of stuff, he's like, my fans know me, my fans believe in me. And like there is that still like childishness to him in his personal life that like we don't really get to see in that same way, except for when he's like, completely letting go on stage and like dancing and all of what he does up on yeah. during his stage presence yeah. where like you see those glimmers of like Harry Styles the human person freaking out and enjoying every moment of being famous <laughs> and like that is yeah. just like pure amazingness to watch and like personally just like reels me back in every time oh it's like that yeah it is a special joy isn't it <laughs> it's just so interesting that like he recognizes like for him personally he has to have that separation between like personal life and his profession and i think in some ways it allows him to bring a certain specialness to his performance like when we do get things from him like you're just saying when he's on stage he's giving 110 percent authentic harry like he's not bullshitting in any of it and you yeah. can't fake that you can't fake you know we can think of a lot of other artists that may come to come to our <laughs> heads in this of like trying so hard to be cool and mm -hmm. it's just not they're just not they're faking it they're absolutely faking it because they think like this is what they should do and harry's like i want to be honest with myself i want to be real yeah. and that's how i want to approach my music i'm like to the point of him feeling like he needs to have some of his personal life being separate I think part of that too is it's like when you are so public and when you give everything to the public you know fans and haters and the media and everyone's gonna have an opinion on your life and everyone's gonna think you should be this or you should be this or whatever and I think it's really hard to be that public and to not let that affect you Yeah. and I think that's kind of why he has this wall of separation is because he's allowed to like have a personal life that's probably very normal 
like he said, he has his close knit group of friends. Like they're very open. They're very honest with each other. And I think if you get wrapped up in that celebrity fame world, those types of relationships are harder and harder to come by. And also why fans have always known that this is in Harry, because along the way, all of his actions and all of his words were leading to this, like from the very beginning, like we said, like you could tell how grounded he was. You could tell how he pushed against those narratives, how Mm -hmm. he didn't want to be that person. And I think that's why fans knew this was always in him. It's because there was those hints along the way. He never did anything that, like, was a red flag. Yeah. And I think that that really shows in the fact that the media was so hard pushing that womanizer idea and that sex symbol idea of who he was as a person. And every single time without fail, he was kind of like, how dare you assume that these women would have sex with me? Like he wasn't saying those exact words, but that's what like these statements are being laced with being like, why can't I just be friends with my friends? Yeah. How, like I don't view myself as a sex symbol. Like he's always been this person, no matter how much he has been like a people pleaser. Like he's never allowed the media's idea for him to completely change him as a person. But there have yeah. been so many people who have gotten famous young who like the media decide who they are and they're just like I'm just gonna I'm gonna lean into that if they think that's who I am because like they don't have time to form their own personalities they just take what's given to them and so that's what really stuck out to me like in this recent Zane Lowe interview he was talking to him about his song as it was and he goes As it was, is kind of about metamorphosis and perspective change and that whole thing of like when you have that, it's not something you have time with. And it's not something where people go, all right, we'll give you a couple more days with this moment and you get to say goodbye to your former self or whatever. It's kind of like by the time you realize it's already gone. And I think it's really a big part of the evolution of what music making can be. And then Harry continues to say, and this was the part that like really stuck with me, as well as like, it doesn't matter if people want you to be that thing they always loved about you or they want you to be that person because you're not that person anymore everyone is changing and you know I think there's no reason to not approach music that way and kind of let it change and turn out differently than you started you don't always get to realize something happened that point was something that I was listening to this while I was like not doing something where I could write it down where I was like I need to go back and re-listen to this and write this down because I feel like that is such a good point because I feel like Harry knows that not only his fans but the world had this idea of who he was and like what they expected from him and he's just like it doesn't matter what you want I'm gonna make the music that I want to make and if you don't like it you know and he said something along these lines too but like I couldn't find it when I went back to it but he said something along the lines of like that music's still going to be there like you can go back and listen to that but I'm going to grow and change and I'm gonna put out more music and continue to do what I want but that's also the thing that I've always found quite special about his fans is that his fans constantly are like oh this album isn't like what Harry likes it's what Harry thinks people like and they'll be like the next album is gonna be even more Harry and so it's like they're always kind of expecting change because they're knowing that Harry's like kind of lowering his guard a little bit like there's always going to be that separation between personal life Harry and professional rock star Harry Styles but he definitely has let his guard down more over the past few albums and kind of let us more into like his life like he's being way more horny on Maine. like he's just doing, <laughs> he's just doing what he wants and like not really afraid of like the judgment that might come or people being like you've changed because his fans are always like no we're gonna get more of him the more he does this yeah. and so i just think it's kind of beautiful in that regard yeah it is it is I think it's and that's what comes with being honest and real with yourself as a person before you even go to make the music yeah and I think that's why fans know that is because he's going to be honest and real he's not going to do anything that's fake he's just not and I think it's really interesting this point of like you don't realize like even yourself you don't necessarily realize you've changed or you don't necessarily realize you're in a different period of your life and it's like only when you look back do you realize that and I think I don't know I just think that's really cool and kind of like a really special sentiment to share yeah and a very personal sentiment to share and very like introspective and just thoughtful and it just goes to show like how thoughtful he is about all of this and I think when we think about the idea of parasocial relationships, Mm -hmm. it's like fans will always have an idea of Harry in their head. And like, we're never going to hundred percent know him. But I think to your point, we also know that the more time he puts into his solo project, the more he's going to like slowly share with us. Yeah. 
A hundred percent. And I just feel like it's a really special thing that he's giving the world in his music and in his choice to like not share and to kind of protect himself in that way, but also like stick to who he knows who he is. And I feel like that's a real testament to like his specifically like his mother and his sister and like being raised in like that environment and like his his mom just being like that kind of mom like I don't even know how to describe it because like I don't know them but just based off of like the the positive ways he's spoken about his relationship with his mother that can be such a special thing and I think when you have that it's really hard to like allow yourself to do something that might disappoint your mom not to call like introspective on Harry and pretend I understand anything about psychology but I think in that regard like the way that he's had like a healthy relationship specifically with his mom and his sister it seems to also have grounded him and being able to like have a home base to go back to regardless of like where home is and I think that's also kind of like what he was talking about with the idea of Harry's house of like home is introspective and like it doesn't really matter if it's like a real place but like if you found it in yourself that's important and it just was really interesting listening to him talk and like hearing even just the difference between like his first interview with Zane Lowe in LA when HS2 came out and his interview with him now and just like how much more he was kind of willing to share and like how much more open he was and it's just like it's a beautiful thing to see but mostly just because like I keep saying like so many ex-boy banders there's like two routes which is either trying to cling on to that boy band fame or trying to push it so far to the side that like you kind of just become a shell of a person and like and you kind of lose yourself in either way where it's either like you are Lance Bass from NSYNC and like NSYNC is like your persona on the internet or you're Justin Timberlake who's done a bit of everything doesn't really maybe cheats on his wife like, isn't, like, that good of a person. People don't really like him. But he still is always tied back to, like, Robin Hare, Justin Timberlake, who, like, caused problems for Britney Spears. <laughs> like, he's just kind of a shell of a human in the eyes of the general public, you know? Yeah. Whereas Harry has surmounted all of this and somehow come out the other side and been able to and like allowed to just become this like beacon of light in like pop culture and pop music and like i'm not trying to again like be like oh harry styles the gift of all gifts but like you can't lie when there is yeah when there is somebody that is this like charismatic and, and enigmatic in pop culture And, like, somebody who clearly understands that, like, I would be nowhere without the people who buy my music and, like, I'm never going to make anybody feel less than me, like, and is very, like, down to earth and, like, understands that he kind of had a traumatic entry into fame and, like, all this stuff. It's just, like, very interesting and I think definitely going to help future musicians going forward. yeah. Because of, like, how open and how clear his path has always been to, like, who he was going to wind up being. Well, I think that makes a lot of sense because it's, like you said, we had these, like, two kind of paths that so far have been laid out for ex-boybanders. And I feel like we've talked about this within, like, the girly pop star frame Mm -hmm. of, like, the path of Britney Spears. And, like, what Billie Eilish is doing is totally different. She's learned from what has happened to Britney Spears and, like, seen that and not want to follow on that path. And I feel like that's kind of what Harry has done. Mm -hmm. And he mentioned in one of these interviews, like, he saw, like, the asshole celebrity, like, being rude to someone and was like, I never want to be that dude. And, and, And you're totally right in saying that he's kind of, like, paving this new pathway of people to like follow in his footsteps in the future of like young celebrities figuring out where they fit in this whole dynamic like we haven't really seen anything like this before Mm -hmm. and so I definitely think it's setting a precedent for people who come after him as well yeah definitely also with the idea of like paving a path for the new generation and all this stuff like him being open about like how kind of emotionally stunted he felt while being in one direction is like 
a really important thing because like we kept saying, like he, they kind of all had to hold their breath because they couldn't do anything too crazy or say anything too crazy because of the pressures of being in the boy band and like what you sign on to when you agree to be in a boy band. And so in this San Lo interview, they were also talking about therapy and how he's really felt like therapy has helped him a lot and how the stigma around it, like how that affect his views on it to begin with. But he said to Zane, I feel like for a really long time, like I kind of emotionally coasted. I didn't really feel anything. And, you know, we kind of go through real highs in the band and it always feel like a relief. Oh, we didn't fail. Oh, that feels like a massive relief. And now I feel like I never really celebrated anything. And I had a great time, like truly. I think sometimes, you know, with therapy, as an example, you open a bunch of doors in your house that you didn't know existed and you find all these rooms and you get to explore them. And then in a time where it'd be easier to emotionally coast, you can no longer do that because you know that room exists. And I feel like that metaphor is like so important to like being in a boy band and kind of compartmentalizing all of the things that you're going through by being thrown into fame so young, having these four other people that you constantly have to do everything with and like this democracy, like he said, that he had to live in where everything was a group decision and like these things of like holding your breath to wait and see if like oh is this album doing well oh is this gonna end tomorrow like is this going to be okay like or is everything gonna get taken away from me and this thing of just like never really dealing with all of the emotions never really having a time to take a breath and really like sit down and look at what you've accomplished or look at like what you were stressing out about and how now he through therapy has had this opportunity to kind of decompartmentalize like what being in a boy band was like and take all those things out of the boxes or as he said open the open those rooms that he never even knew were there and like deal with what he went through and be able to come out the other side and be emotionally available to even give a quote like this in an interview or like feel comfortable kind of becoming a man in the public eye and again I think that that just even more so shows that like the youth coming up in music have these quotes to go back to have somebody like him to look up to where they can see like okay it's okay to like not be able to deal with something that is both positive and traumatic at the same time while it's happening but it's also okay to like learn from that and like take that and realize like okay this kind of made me who I am as a person and not let it turn yourself against you or like your upbringing or whatever the case may be because I feel like in regards to like Liam or even Zane the One Direction trauma really affected them and I think you can see that in like how Zane a lot of his personality after leaving One Direction was that he was really into weed or that Liam has suffered with alcoholism and talked about that. It's like you see that rather than dealing with what they went through from being in the boy band, they took to substances or they kind of tried to escape the spotlight in whatever way that they did. Whereas like Harry seemed to deal with it in like a very healthy way. And I feel like puts really good building blocks in space for younger people who are coming up in the industry now. I think also, especially especially with this album cycle, there's a part of him that's very relatable. Like yeah. for the fact that he's one of the most famous people and was in a boy band, which are two completely unrelatable things. Mm-hmm. Like talking about emotional coasting is something that everyone can relate to. Yeah. Everyone. And you've had those periods of, and even just him talking about the different periods of his life. We can all relate to that. Like he's talking about things that like are universal, that are just human things. He's not talking about his fame, really. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, of course, that's what's happened to him, but. I don't know. I think it just adds that extra factor of like him being so open and being so personable, but in a way that everyone can relate to. I think that's really special. And I think also in the vein of reflecting on the boy band days, he mentioned this in like the Better Homes and Garden interview. And he also spent like a pretty long time talking about this with Zane Lowe. As he said that he essentially had this like realization moment when he saw Billie Eilish coming up because Billie was like a few years younger than him. And like they had been doing one direction for a while at this point and it's like that pressure to always feel like the hottest new thing or like the youngest coolest thing and it was this realization that like they're aging and like there's always gonna be something that's like the younger cooler thing and that you can't always hold on to that same level of fame and I think that realization is really important because like you just said with like the two examples of what we see ex-boy banders doing it feels like so badly they're trying to hold on to that same level of fame Mm -hmm. and 
Harry said like this was like a really big realization point for him where he's like I need to do something and make music that is like what I want to be doing and not trying to hold on to this idea of being young and being famous because it's not always going to be that way and I think that too is like really important and really special and as he's like navigating life and as he's like coming into his own and figuring out who he is of knowing that things are going to be different and knowing that it's okay like that's okay and having those realizations and also like I think a really great quote from the Better Homes and Garden interview was just that he said you can't win music it's not like Formula One and it's like that is like so that that is the approach of how so many people in the industry approach music Mm -hmm. is they treat it like it's a competition to be won and we've had this conversation in multiple different ways talking about the billboard charts and like music awards and all these things of like it's not it's not that's not what it's about and I think Harry's really like come to terms with that and wrapped that into how he approaches music and how he approaches life and the other thing which just like kind of as a conclusionary note to all of this is like the whole treat people with kindness thing. I think probably I just wasn't paying very much attention to his interviews previously, but through all of this research, it's very apparent that like, that's not just like a cute trendy thing for him to say that's like popular and no will sell. Like he genuinely uses that in how he approaches his everyday life and how he treats people and how he treats himself. And I think that's really important that like, it's not fake. It's not just a saying, like he genuinely embodies that. Yeah. And I think that that's a really important thing for you to, like, for anybody to acknowledge, but, like, just for you to bring up, because his whole ethos is, like, I want to be, like, as ethically famous as I possibly can be. (laughs) And it's so interesting because it feels like something, like, oh, like, everything I'm saying just feels like I'm writing a love letter to Harry Styles after making fun of him for the past year. But... (laughs) (laughs) But it's one of those things where you're going to make fun of, like, your favorite celebrity. You're going to, like, have uncomfortable emotions about, like, having a parasocial relationship with a person, especially a person who, like, has created a parasocial personality specifically for us to, like, take on to and, like, do whatever we want with because it's in order to keep himself safe and sane, which I think is very interesting. And I think, again, like this interview cycle that he's done around Harry's house is the most open he's ever really been like with his real self, which is really interesting to see. And I think that he's kind of realizing as he's getting older, like what parts of himself he can share and like that he doesn't necessarily have to be 100% guarded all the time but I think also it must be hard to have people create an idea of who you are and like not necessarily know if you can live up to that or whatever the case is and so putting those walls down and like being more available might make it a bit easier to like combine the two so that it feels less of like this pressure to be a person that his fans have created without his permission is like the best way to put it because I know that's like what we kind of all do is like we all have this idea of who Harry Styles is in our heads and that's him and he's like well actually and he's actually kind of a better person than I thought he was yeah which is quite heartwarming I think it's because he's being so open with us with this album cycle with these interviews that Mm -hmm. like we're able to it's like getting at the root of like what he stands for yeah like he's basically talking about his values and what he stands for and i think that helps fans paint a much better picture of him than just somebody who likes to go swimming in cold water ponds and does juice cleanses like that gives us nothing but like him talking about his values gives us everything yeah exactly like i would so much rather again like it doesn't matter to me anymore that he does bridge people things that i could never dream of doing when i know that he is as kind of a soul as i always felt like he was and it's kind of refreshing to like hear these things and like hear him talking about how like also during the pandemic while it became safer for him to travel but like still a lot of people weren't going out and doing as much that like he and a friend drove to Italy and then he stayed in Italy for a few weeks and just like was a person and like went to like cafes and didn't feel like he constantly had to be on the move and constantly had to be like going 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 like he was able to like sit and enjoy his coffee and enjoy his time and then enjoy the scenery and just like be a human for a little while and I feel like that's just important for fans of any artist to hear is like that reminder of like oh they're a real person with like thoughts and feelings and emotions and they have to deal with 
the pressure of making their fans happy and all of these things like there's just so much pressure that comes with being a famous person in the spotlight especially into like what we've created Harry Styles into as like a fandom you know like myself included we've all made him like I said like into something that like he could never really be and I just think that it's like these beautiful things of him talking about like therapy and realizing these moments in his life and getting the chance to breathe and like getting the chance to like create with people in a much more conducive environment than feeling like you need to rush out an album where he's saying like yeah we came together we kind of came up with music and then we went our separate ways and lived our lives and then came back together and it didn't feel like there was all this pressure to like create something just because and like everything we were doing was out of like passion and like actual want to create rather than anything else and I just think that that while this pandemic has been horrible there have been certain gifts that it's given a lot of people and that they've been able to find themselves in this time of like FOMO not existing and having to exist within your own bubble and it's really kind of amazing to know that I know a lot of us like our listeners and my friends and my family even like have gone through our own personal journeys over the past like two and a half years and to know that like Harry Styles was going through that at the same time is like kind of a really nice thing to feel yeah yeah just on a more privileged level than the rest of us you know yeah like a way way nicer hotel than I don't have to worry about paying your bills Yeah, so relatable, but unrelatable, but in the long run, his value system relatable. Like, in all honesty, like, jokes aside, it is very refreshing for us to see this. And, like, I think this is why we wanted to spend so much time specifically talking about Harry is because it's so rare to see this. It's so rare. And the way he's choosing to show us certain aspects of his life is very telling of who he is. And, like I said, it paints a better picture for us than knowing what his like hobbies are you know what I mean so I think that's why in the long run why we wanted to do this episode on Harry is like the arc that we've seen and like you said the metamorphosis that we've seen and how it's so different from a lot of pop stars and a lot of boy band pop stars that we've seen and yeah it's really just gonna pave the way for for future as well yeah a hundred percent and it's just exciting it's exciting to like see this happen and like to see somebody who's been so close become more open and like I said I just think it's gonna set a precedent for the future and like again it's just like all of these people kind of in their late 20s early 30s I think are really setting the stage in a really incredible way for like people to come because they got to learn lessons from like the really fucked up cards that were handed to the people before them and the ones that are really shining bright right now are shining so bright and I think are really going to help change the industry which is like all we could ever hope for as name three songs as like what we're what like our passions are as this podcast so it's just quite exciting to see that Harry is genuinely at the forefront of all of this when like this whole idea came to be because we were like people need to stop still treating one direction fans like shit <laughs> um so yeah, it's no really... pressure harry <laughs> no pressure harry but uh don't no put pressure. it up <laughs> yeah so it really is a beautiful moment and hopefully we never have to rescind this episode <laughs> so yeah i mean for all of y'all who have been along on this one direction harry styles journey we would love to hear your thoughts and feelings about all of this because again being a fangirl is hard being a one direction fan has been exhausting especially these last two years even without the band even existing existing and so i'm sure we all have a lot to say and i'd love to hear your guys thoughts you can share those with us over on social media we are at name three songs on instagram twitter what have you or if you have any personal beef with anything we said today or want to just give us a love letter because we finally gave harry his flowers you can do so on social media i'm at sarah underscore fagan and jenna is at jenna underscore million so thanks for joining us this week on name three songs and until next time never let anyone make you feel bad about your favorite band and remember you're never too cool to listen to harry styles don't forget to subscribe to be notified when each episode comes out and leave us a five-star review they really help if you want to find out more about any of the sources we referenced in this episode you can visit name3songs.com